Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the 508th edition. The one we're going to tape on Tuesday because we're just too busy Monday and Friday. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Tuesday, the 4th of June, 65 plus 1, 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, clerical and laity alike, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. You have a responsibility as a viewer and a listener, and those responsibilities include, but are not limited to, sharing the program with your friends, family, and church, liking the program on Facebook or YouTube, there's a little button, you just click the the thumb and it likes us. I want you to comment on the show in the show comments. If you want to correct us in error, you can do that. If you want to enhance what we said by adding your own comments, you can do that. If you want to correct other people in the comments, that's what it's there for. Also, we have a podcast in the show notes. You can get the link to the podcast. It's very popular amongst the millennials and uh, the people who are very good with technology, even better than myself. Gentlemen, welcome back to the program. A little talk quick about my chaos. Uh, I have family visiting. Mom and dad are here because Benjamin had his graduation on Saturday and my daughter's getting married on June 8th. That's what, Saturday? Next Saturday. And so this is the only day we can tape. I just live in in a, a good 10 days of chaos here. I'm sorry, but that's that's June in America. Gavin, birthday. You're older. What, you're 49 now, right? <laughs> 65. <clears throat> but but my, my youngest daughter shares my birthday. So mm-hmm. every single birthday since she was born 21 years ago has been shared. And actually, that's quite nice. Um, so she was 21. Uh, she's just about to graduate from her university. And I was 65, which seems terribly old. And um, uh, I lie awake at night hoping I'll make it to 66 in the present circumstances. But we had a great celebration, I'm pleased to say. Now, all my kids are deserting me for Pittsburgh. Uh, George, your family, your children have run out to the the left coast. Yes, one daughter is now living in Thousand Oaks, and uh, the other daughter who had been living in Miami has been offered a job, and uh, she's been offered several jobs. It's, I wish the job market were like this when I was their age, but she has a choice between Seattle, uh, San Francisco, and Las Vegas. And being of the twilight generation as a teenager, the lore of going to uh, Seattle with all these pale children in an ever, ever uh, circling clouds, I think might be irresistible. I'm urging her Las Vegas because uh, she, like me, has the uh, uh, seasonal affective disorder. We need the sun. And I think Las Vegas is a healthier place for her. Maybe not morally, but <laughs> yeah, <it's okay. laughs> uh, psychologically. Well, so that, that, we've got another child moving cross country. Uh, and that's been really hard here in the Northeast. We've had very little sun. This is like our fourth day of sun in, in a row, and people are all finally tired of the sun. So we'll have to see what happens with our families. It's just that type of, that type of uh, seasonal time for George, Gavin, and I. We need to move on to the news, got a lot to cover today, Um, and the first story we're going to do is kind of a follow-up story to one we previously covered twice, Mm. and it's the Jonathan Parker uh, story. He is a vicar in the Church of England who recently resigned his post as uh, part of the school and church, and I don't know if he completely quit the Church of England as well, over transgenderism and the curriculum being forced upon the school that he's involved with. And a lot of this has to do with mermaids. We covered mermaids two weeks ago, so we don't have to really go into that again. But I want Gavin to give a quick update on some of the latest controversy surrounding the Jonathan Parker issue, because there's words and statements being put out that are just going with some of the veracity and accuracy of the points being made and who said what. I make some of my wisest statements in the pre-show conversation. (laughs) (laughs) And George George does too. (laughs) One of the things that George said that I hope he'll repeat, and if not, I'll repeat it for him, but less well, is that when there are issues of principle uh, that really matter, it's not long before, uh, as part of the Christian 
political dialogue, people fall out about details. Uh, and we, we fight each other about details when we should really be sticking together about principles. Mm -hmm. So there are issues about the, the language, um, the accuracy that John Parker used as he resigned. He, uh, he, he claimed his bishop was profoundly unsupportive, but, but he did it in, in, in ways that might involve a bit of hyperbole and one or two loose words. Uh, but they didn't mask the fact that his bishop is a strong progressive proponent of the whole anti-Christian cultural change, and John was left fighting it by himself. So um, his, his bishop is going to issue a repudiation of some of the things that John implied in his statement. And of course, now this means that people are lining up, some pro the bishop, some pro John Parker, uh, and, and the essential focus, the moral edge of the struggle could easily be lost. And so my sympathies are very strongly with John Parker, because even if he did uh, express himself with, uh, without a precision that he might otherwise have brought to it, uh, he's been under an enormous amount of strain as he's been fighting this battle. And, uh, uh, and, and, and if, if he's given some ammunition to his critics by using language less precisely he should have done, that's a shame. But the essential thing is that he's been fighting a profoundly anti-Christian educational policy in a Church of England school, and on the other side of the battle has, Lord, has been his diocesan bishop and the Department of Education. And finally, under the strain, he's, he has uh, he's snapped, his patience with the Church of England has snapped, and he's decided to resign his parish, and I'm almost certain leave the Church of England. I rather hope you'll write to me and ask me for the details of, of how you do that. They're rather exotic, yes. and they only cost you £10. And in my case, when I handed in this wonderful uh, exotic form, it was to a woman uh, in, in Islamic covering behind a grill in the High Court of London. And I thought, this is just typical. This is exactly <laughs> emblematic of what's you going on. So, John, if you, if you watch us, if you need any detailed help, I can provide you with a three-line guide on how to put yourself out of reach of the malevolent Church of England institutionally. But meanwhile, one of the things we have to do is to support him and to support others. If I have a frustration, it's that every so often a matter of principle comes up and one man makes a stand and then, you know, something happens. But all around the country, everybody else sharing the same principle looks on and it's almost as if the dominoes fall, but they fall one by one in an isolated way. There is no there is no collective sense that what's happening in the Church of England is most seriously apostate and immoral. And we are in very real trouble. All right, George, that's a good setup. We all know that Jonathan Parker is not where the buck stops. I guess you would say pound in over in England. The pound does not stop here. Where does the pound stop, George? It stops with the man in charge, uh, Justin Welby. As Gavin mentioned, he authored the preface to this guideline which I believe to be anti-church, anti-science. That is, you, it's an ideology masquerading as an educational tool that is being used to teach children about transgenderism in a, uh, in a way that is, well, I find appalling. And coincidentally, while all this is going on, Justin Welby was in Nairobi. Now, it may be ha happenstance that Justin Welby flew to Nairobi in the same week that the Archbishop of Kenya announced that he was not going to Lambeth and he had asked the Kenyan bishops also to boycott the Lambeth Conference. So we may see 30, 35 out of the 40 bishops from Kenya giving it a pass this year. And according to the Nairobi Standard, a newspaper in the, in the city, a reputable newspaper, Justin Welby preached at All Saints Cathedral, Nairobi, and after the service he took questions from reporters. And the questions were about homosexuality, of course. Kenya right now has just gone through a major court case that has upheld the country's sodomy laws. That's the tech, I'm not being pejorative. Mm -hmm. That's the technical term for laws that criminalize what are called unnatural sexual acts between persons of the same sex. The Kenyan church has uh, enthusiastically endorsed upholding the sodomy laws, making homosexuality a crime, as it was uh, in Texas until 1994, I think it was, as it was in England up until the late 60s. 
Kenya still maintains those laws. Justin Welby was asked about that. He had no comment to make. Then he went on to say, in connection with the sodomy laws, that the Anglican Communion does not per permit same-sex marriage, and that the Church of England does not allow same-sex marriage. Uh, we need to have a space to allow us to discuss this, but his belief is that in traditional marriage, Justin Welby has come out to the Kenyans saying that he supports marriage between one man, one woman for life, to the, for the exclusion of all others, mm -hmm. for life. This is, the this is the truth as laid down in Nairobi. And then we have the truth as laid down in England. So that uh, I don't, uh, I, I don't uh, begrudge John Parker for having uh, lost his temper with the Church of England for prevaricating mm -hmm. on the truth. where. Now, I don't, now, I've written to Lambeth Palace uh, on Sunday night asking them to confirm the veracity of these statements. They've not gotten back to me. Uh, so I can only say at this point is that the Nairobi Standard has said this, that said this. I'd like to keep the focus on what you were saying halfway through your conversation, <clears throat> because um, you're quite right when you say Justin Welby makes one moral and theological case to one audience and changes it for another audience. So the audience, when he spoke to the spectator, Michael Gove interviewed him about a year and a half ago. And he then, in order to curry favor with a secular audience, audience uh, uh, offered the hypothesis that if one of his children were gay, he would. And then he went on to talk very affirmatively about trying to meet people on their own, on their own terms. The problem, and his writing this forward in the Gender Transition booklet really matters because it, it's not just that each issue itself has a theological core, which the Bible speaks to. <clears throat> it's that the, the, the place we're in at the moment culturally is that there are a series of assaults, one by one by one by one, uh, which are leading to a complete unraveling of the Judeo-Christian tradition. I remember when I was 21 with people arguing about whether or not women should obey their husbands in the marriage service. And it was, well, it doesn't really matter because feminism doesn't allow it anyway. What on earth did St. Paul know? How, how, what, did he, what did he mean when he was talking about this, this mystical, uh, subverted hierarchy where, where love and power uh, work against each other in the favor of love? And everyone said, well, it doesn't matter. Let's forget it. But actually, the moment you unglue Christian revelation and the pattern that God has given us, uh, there is there is no ending of the unraveling. It's like pulling a sweater. You pull one one skein out, and the whole sweater falls to pieces. We moved on from there, which didn't seem terribly important, ultimately to gay marriage. Well, so people didn't die in the ditch on gay marriage. Welby says yes. The theoretically, we keep the rules, but we're terribly sympathetic. And then the next step, of course, is is gender transition. What would Welby do? Well, he writes the foreword. Um, in, in, in order to affirm and encourage the victims of this, this stereotyping. What's going to happen next? It's going to be paedophilia. We know it is. All the arguments that have been lined up, we can't help it. We're born this way. Love is love. We'll move over there. The, the problem is that, that, that in order to curry favor with the secular society, uh, Welby has adopted a secular anti-Christian anti program. And it's, it's the old frog cooking idea. You put the frog in the pot, make sure you only simmer it lightly, and it will never jump out. John Parker jumped out. God bless him. My frustration is that other people should see that Welby is one of the agencies of turning up the satanic heat on the pot. And, and there should be more than just occasional people saying, I won't go beyond this point. Because the church... And George, I think you're wrong about Medjugorje. Not that we'll get into Marian apparitions, but 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 the well the Welby thing is so much more seriously than whether the Virgin Mary did or didn't speak to the church. When she speaks to the church, she tells it to repent more and pray more. What's wrong with that? But meanwhile, what we've got in Anglican terms is an is a, is a serious capitulation to a demonic, anti-biblical, secular theology that is destroying the church from the inside whilst it's also being destroyed from the outside. Well, let, let's do the intro for that. We need to give credit where credit's due. We are critics of the church and sometimes are overly critical of Justin and the Church of England, but they've now set up a new program to reach unchurched people groups. And I thought we could sit here and talk about 
the unreached people like Tiger Woods and other golfers who now have the opportunity to go to a cathedral and play putt-putt golf in the nave. Uh, what's the news there, Gavin? G- Gavin. Gavin. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll answer to my Lord. Or your no, yes, right? yes, 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 of course. <laughs> Between us, Gavin, by all means. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the BBC phoned me yesterday and very sweetly said, would you like, would you have a comment on the on Rochester Cathedral's plans to turn the cathedral over to become a, a crazy golf course uh, during the summer to get people in? And I said, yes, I'd very happily give you my opinion. <laughs> On this, so a number of cathedrals have done this. Uh, Norwich Cathedral built them to it by planning to build a helter skelter in the church. Uh, what what Rochester have done is they said, given that that less than two percent of the country darken the doorstep of an Anglican church with any regularity, we have to get people in. So let's get them in by turning the church into a kind of entertainment centre. Let's entertain people. If that's the only way of getting them in, let let's at least get them in. And, and in my 10 seconds, I will say, you know, you all believe in good and evil, but we're all going to be judged and you need to be saved. And the church, Jesus will save you if you repent. Now, that's the good. You know, we've been weighed in the balances and found wanting and we're really all of us in trouble. We can get saved and changed. It's a very different theology or understanding. It's a very different religion from the therapeutic, you're welcome, Come and relax and play golf while you're at it, while God watches and maybe applauds. So um, the, the problem is we're dealing with two different religions, two different theologies. It, it, it won't be enough to get people into church. But if you go to seeker churches, oftentimes I see a theater set up. I see stage lighting. I see dark curtains that open and close. I see fog machines. Uh, Kevin, you- golf. <laughs> Putt putt golf is minor compared to some of what I see in secret churches. I went, a friend of mine died in a very tragic uh, swimming accident. He's my age exactly, and he, he died at 64 and three quarters uh, in a swimming accident off Gibraltar, and he'd been going to Holy Trinity Brompton all his life. Mm-hmm. So I went to his funeral service two weeks ago. Uh, actually, astonishingly, there wasn't a funeral service. The family decided this is their own matter. I, I won't comment on it further. They decided on a private funeral. So I, I, I couldn't knock on the box and say to him, you idiot, what were you doing? <laughs> Swimming in a riptide. Uh, off in, in, anyway, so instead it was a Thanksgiving service. Mm-hmm. That, that's another theological problem when you can't say goodbye to the body and you become de-incarnational as religion. But I went into Holy Trinity Brompton. To Holy Trinity Brompton. I hadn't been in for a long time. And there around the altar, it had been lit up with nightclub bulbs. Do you know those single bulbs that you put across the stage? And there where the altar should have been under a huge screen was a pair of drums. Now, I admit, I don't like drums. I don't like drumming music very much. Uh, I'm sure it's my fault. But, but, but that's where Jesus should have been. That's where the altar should have been. At the very least, that's where the Bible should have been. And so we had, we had theatre land. Again, they'll say... This is the only way we can make contact with people whose culture is completely an, uh, unchristian or anti-Christian. But the danger with that is that you meet people so much on their own terms that, that you, you begin by entertaining them and you never stop entertaining them. But there's equally an argument evangelistically. Since everyone recognizes that the, uh, the, the, the reality of good and evil, I was lecturing my poor 21-year-old daughter on Zoroastra, on Zoroastrianism, because, <laughs> because that's exactly the point that they were making without the insights that Jesus brought to it. Everyone recognizes we're involved in a serious struggle. The, the whole Trump thing is people fulminating themselves into a, into a moral passion of who's right and who's wrong. The rightness and wrongness of things divides us right down the middle. Now, you could quite as easily reach out to people and say, we're in trouble because we're going to be judged. And, and you can be forgiven as to say, we'd like to entertain you and make you feel happy. And then when you're truly relaxed, tell you that, that the God, the therapist, approves of all that you do and is very happy to see you here while you play golf. It's a serious theological error. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I want to, we, we got to finish up here. I just saw in the news, George, that uh, 50,000 people were to show up to protest President Trump coming to England for a state affair, they, they call it. 
uh, they were very disappointed that they only had 800 people. I think they were hoping because the Church of England bishops have been speaking up against Trump as well. Uh, I forget which bishop it was. I hope you can Bayes. remind us. What's it? <laughs> Paul Bayes, the bishop okay. of Liverpool. Um, there is a disaster afoot as far as the press and the reality and what Trump is doing in England. Can you give us a, an update on that? I don't want to. Uh, you don't want to. <laughs> no, I, 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 I tell you why. And that, uh, well, I'm going to. Uh, I don't particularly care what Paul Bays has to say about oh, politics. Oh, okay, fine. Sure. He he gave he spoke on the BBC Sunday program and he made some disparaging marks about Donald Trump that are neither original nor particularly interesting, but he added a Christian twist by saying, "By your fruits you shall know them." Mm -hmm. And he believes the fruits of Donald Trump's presidency are evil and racism, this and that. Yeah, we've all this heard this many, many times before. But I'm thinking the bishop has some memory of a misty youth where he once read the Bible, and by your fruits you shall know them. And I wanted to ask the bishop, by what fruits shall we know your ministry? Or the Church uh, of what, are the, what are the fruits of the ministry of the Church of England that Paul Bays typifies? Mm -hmm. The aggressive, progressive left. What have they done? to uh, bring people to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. What hospitals have they built? What prisoners have they freed? What have they done to change this world for Christ? It's easy to pitch hard balls at Donald Trump. Uh, he can take it. I don't need to defend him. But maybe it's an American perspective, but it's just bad. It's vulgar for a bishop to behave this way, especially when a lot of what he says is ignorant and just can be repeated by any, oh, any uh, Starbucks barista. Uh, what, uh, one of the differences between our political commentators is that th we have <clears throat> the majority of the left-wing people who are saying this is terrible that Trump is here. Uh, he's a fascist. They're literally calling him uh, a fascist. It's quite terrible misuse of the word. A few sensible people say, but look, this is a state visit. This is how Kevin introduced this. And in a state visit, Trump is coming to represent American servicemen who gave their lives uh, on the anniversary of D-Day, that's why it's happening. Uh, in in once again, in this enormous Second World War where good and evil really were arranged against each other. So Trump is coming as a representative of of the Americans who gave their lives to save Europe. The, the idea that a, a, even a, a bishop of the Church of England can't distinguish between a state visit where Trump comes not on his parading his own virtues, but parading the heroic sacrifice of a generation of soldiers. It's astonishingly ignorant. And actually, frankly, it's a bit poisonous, too. It's almost as if there's so much poison in the system, they can't stop it leaking out somewhere, even though their understanding of constitutional issues, uh, the, 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 the exactitude of the Church of England and what state visits mean uh, is, is, you know, is in place. They, they know the reality, but they can't stop the poison leaking out. And it, it's a tragedy. And I think that that criticism can be waged against me at times. In other words, I will, I've said something discourteous about Paul Bays. Um, and I usually, whenever we finish a show, I say, oh, Kevin, can you cut that out? Uh, <laughs> and Edit. Because it, in, in, some, in some respects, it's, it goes against what we started off the show by saying. In other words, we were saying, give John Parker some slack. He may have... Uh, made a mistake here or there in the facts, but he's on the right trajectory. He means well, he's seeking the good for the kingdom. Give him some slack. Why shouldn't I give Paul Bays and the Dean of Rochester Cathedral with putt-putt golf some slack? Well, I mean, what's the, be. Why, is a, what is the difference, <laughs> Gavin? Help solve my conscience to say <laughs> oh, what the difference is. I'm so pleased that's not a rhetorical question because the answer <laughs> is a matter of spiritual discernment. And it's, it's as you Americans say, it's a $64,000 question. Since pounds are worth more at the moment, it's a 54,000 pound question. It's all about the trajectory between good and evil. We all make mistakes. Uh, and George, you're quite right to, to remind us uh, to to uh, the, the we must be careful about how we talk about people in an ad hominem context. I'm forever asking Kevin to cut out my pious outbursts from the show. <laughs> um, but in this particular case, Justin Welby and Paul Bayes are fighting for the wrong spiritual side. Uh, it's partly, I think, because they lack discernment, they've misread the Bible, but they've mistaken politics for theology. 
And so they, they're both produced, they're both following a secular political agenda that this very critical time in the life of our culture is anti-Christian, leaving aside uh, Trump's virtues and vices as a, as, a, as a person. One of the most important things that Trump did was to stop the Hillary and Obama project. The Hillary and Obama project was a, a, a profoundly pro-abortion, pro-progressive uh, uh, agenda, which, which belittled Christianity wherever it could, even to the extent of calling us Easter worshippers right. instead of Christians. So the, the, for, forget Trump's personal vices. They're up to God to, to live with. But as a political agency and as president of the United States, at the moment, Paul Bayes needs to remember that Trump is representing a generation of men who gave their lives to defeat real fascism, not synthetic fascism, which is what Trump is accused of. And, right. and Justin Welby and the Bishop of Rochester needs to be reminded that when John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus, and when Mary appeared at Medjugorje, Fatima, Garibondal, Lourdes, and, and elsewhere, the invitation is always to repent. First we repent, then we discover grace. That's the serious theological error the Church of England has fallen into. Let me, let me preempt uh, some uh, comments. Gavin, are you putting Holy Trinity Brompton on that same trajectory as Paul Bayes and the Archbishop of Canterbury by removing the altar and the cross from the church, by making it into a theater? Are it, they it, misguided or are they on the wrong trajectory? That's a question I can't answer, but I'll tell you what worries me about it. What worries me about Holy Trinity Brompton is that they now invite gay couples into their pre-wedding pre preparation without any distinction. On the one hand, they say, but this is how we get people to evangelize them. As long as they hear the good news, uh, they, they stand a chance of being saved. But we never hear that people have been delivered from uh, their, their, their sexual misidentity uh, or their life outside heterosexual marriage. Uh, and there is, there is always the danger that if you go overboard with imminence and overboard with grace, you lose transcendence and you lose judgment. Clearly, all of us are called to balance these things. And the balancing is very delicate. But just at this critical moment, if I was, if Holy Trinity Brompton asked me my advice, I would say the real danger is going too far towards imminence, entertainment and grace. That needs at some point now to be to be the balancing of transcendence, judgment, and, and, and repentance. Well, let me give you a personal example that uh, uh, one of the things we do is I, we, our church is doing quite well. We're growing and all this and that. And one of the things is I've instituted a special service where people bring their dogs. Uh, many people in this part of the world have no family and their dog is their only companion. And many, most of them have emotional sentimental attachments to this dog and i invite them bring your dog to church with you if it's well behaved it can sit next to you we don't worship the dog we don't do you know don't give them communion nothing like that but we have if you will a pet friendly worship service we have stone floors so it's not a big deal if there's an accident is that theologically akin to putt putt golf or is, that an or is that an accommodation to the emotional needs of people who they don't leave home without their dog? It's something much more beautiful even than that. If you read your C.S. Lewis, you'll know that one of the things that Lewis explained is that, that the whole theological work of God the Father and the Creator is to draw humanity into the Godhead, but not just us by ourselves, but with the whole of creation and perhaps closest to humanity, one step away are our dogs. And one of the things that happens to a dog when you love it uh, and you train it is it becomes very much like a human. You love the dog and you train it, and by the way, discipline it, Holy Trinity Brompton, and <laughs> you then find it becomes like a human. And human beings are becoming like what? They're becoming, we're becoming like the Holy Trinity. This is the whole dynamic of salvation reaching right down through creation. So you're blessing, by blessing dogs, you're not entertaining people uh, or, or, or giving them some kind of pseudo anthropological comfort. You're quite rightly taking this this project of transformation that the Holy Trinity has at the heart of it that concentrates on humanity but is intended to bring creation as we steward it. That's very different from turning 
worship and the Holy Eucharist into a nightclub entertainment experience. Well, I want to back up and, and give a bigger reality here. A lot of people here in Milford don't go to church because they're going to miss their tea time. You know, you call up at the country club, you got to schedule it for noon or 12, it's, they're little five minute, 10 minute segments. If you're going to have putt putt at the cathedral, I don't have to worry about missing my tea time, and I'm more likely to go. That must be some of the thinking that's going on here. Gentlemen, we've gone on and on and on. I want to thank our patient audience for our theological discussions that you've listened to. Um, it's it's a strange world we live in. Uh, uh, may, may I just mention, Kevin, uh, yeah. for those of you reaching uh, Gavin's prime of life, 65, and <laughs> you will, uh, if you're in the United States, you will at a certain point get in your car and move to Florida. Sorry. As you cross the line between Georgia and Florida, there's a little, there's a government building it. When you stop, they will hand you a small white dog and that will make you an official <laughs> resident of the state of Florida. Where you don't have to pay state income tax. It's a wonderful state. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you've been listening to bits of episode 508, the ones Kevin doesn't cut out, of Anglican, extremely unscripted, somewhat spontaneous, and occasionally intemperate, which we ask your forgiveness and your prayers. Mm -hmm.